today our topic is the golden age of Islam. So in the same way that yesterday we were looking at ancient Greece, today we're moving forward about a thousand years, actually more than a thousand years, into a period of time when a large portion of the world is experiencing what we call a golden age. So a golden age is when a culture is flourishing and thriving and doing extremely well. Now at this point in time, there is a, the reason why this part of the world, so we're going to be in North Africa, the Middle East, uh, this sort of area sort of moving north up into Spain, and it moves farther east, you'll see Islam spreading into places like Southeast Asia, China, up north into Spain, south into Africa. Yes, Shep? What topic was that we were talking about? Oh, today the big topics that we're going to talk about, you are going to see some folks pulled out some things from number three last period. Some folks pulled out, there's a lot of number four, some pretty critical points for number four. So how has the way science has done changed over time? There's a lot of that, little bits of how scientists have built on their predecessors' work. Um, I hadn't thought of it this way, but somebody pointed out a really good example of number five last period, how scientists' mistakes led to new discoveries. Uh, and there's a fair bit of number seven, how his identity impacted his voices we hear in science. So those, I would say, are the big ones for today. Uh, very good to keep track of our guiding questions, our key ideas. Remember, you're not trying to write down everything I say. You're focusing on getting down evidence for these possible essay topics. So, at this point in time, there is a religion, Islam, that's beginning to spread across the world. And as it spreads, with it is spreading knowledge. And there's a specific reason for this. You might not be used to, in our modern, you know, current world, many people don't think of religion as a force for knowledge. But at this point in time in history, it very much is. Because in Islam, it is viewed as crucial, as extremely important, that each individual be able to read and study the holy book of that religion. So the Quran, which is this book, is meant to be a topic of study for every single person. So certain religions really emphasize scholarship, other religions don't as much. At this point in time, the most common religion in like much of Europe is Catholicism. And under Catholicism, individual people don't need to study the Bible. Right? That becomes more of a thing once we get into Protestantism a little bit later. But under Catholicism, Bible study is just not a huge deal. Um, under Judaism, study of the Torah is a huge deal, but only for certain aspects of the population. Uh, and under Islam, study of the Quran is critical for everyone. For all people who are part of this religion. Regardless of your class, regardless of your race, regardless of your gender. It is expected that you're going to be able to read Arabic, which is the language that the Quran is written in, and engage in acts of scholarship. And because of that, we see as this society begins to flourish, there are parts of the world in North Africa and the Middle East at this point in time that hit near universal literacy where almost every single person in the population can read, regardless of social class. This is one of the first times in world history that this occurs. And with that, we see an incredible flourishing of knowledge. Because as the religion spreads, so too does this value that you need to be able to study. And in particular, there's a, a specific language that you need. You need to study Arabic so you can read the Quran in Arabic. And that means that if you are a Muslim who lives in China or Southeast Asia, then in addition to whatever language you speak natively, you're probably learning Arabic as a second language. Which means suddenly, people from all over the world are able to communicate. They have a shared language with people from other cultures. So you might be living in Africa, or you might be living in Indonesia, or China, or India, or Spain. And you might share a second language with people from all of these other parts of the world. And so what happens is as scholarship is viewed as this crucial language, scholars from all over the world begin to coalesce 
on the Middle East. And they bring with them the knowledge of their own people. So Chinese scholarship is being brought from China to the Middle East and translated into Arabic. African scholarship is being brought from Africa to the Middle East and translated into Arabic. Spanish knowledge is being brought. Knowledge from India. The concept of zero and the set of numbers come from India. In fact, we call them Arabic numerals, right? Things like one, two, three, four, five, right? The numbers that we write. If you are an Arabic speaker, you call them Hindu numerals, right? Because we got them from the Arab world, and the Arab world got them from India as these scholars traveled to the Middle East and learned all the same language. We have, for the first time, a language of scholarship. People from different, from different cultures can share knowledge. And with this flourishing, there is an incredible demand for schools. Because if you have this cultural value of everyone is supposed to be able to learn to read, then you need to build a pretty robust educational system. Enter our heroine, Fatima al -Firi. Fatima al -Firi is from uh, a town called Karawiya in Tunisia, which is in North Africa. And she is one of two daughters, her and Miriam, of a wealthy merchant. Her family emigrates from, along with many other people, there's a whole influx of people moving to this really prosperous area of the world. Yes? Uh, what's the town? How do you spell the town? All right, so I'm going to say a thing about spellings. You know how the word Hanukkah has a bajillion different spellings? The reason why the word Hanukkah has a bajillion different spellings is because it's not an English word. The correct spelling is in Hebrew, which has its own like system of letters that doesn't match perfectly to English. Right? They've got their own alphabet. And so the correct spelling is in Hebrew. And if you try to write it in English, all you can do is what's called transliteration, which is like you do your best to be like, well, this letter, this combination of, of letters in English sounds like this symbol in Hebrew. And you end up with a bunch of different competing spellings. So some people spell Hanukkah with a CH, some spell it with an H. Exactly how many H's, how many N's, how many K's, that's going to vary. There isn't a correct spelling in English because the correct spelling is in Hebrew. Same thing is going to be true here. So her hometown is in Tunisia, uh, T-U-N-I-S-I-A, which is a country in North Africa. Uh, and she moves with her sister and father to Fez, Morocco, F-E-Z. And when her father dies, it's worth noting, like, inheritance laws really vary depending on what part of the world you're in and what your culture is. But in her culture, there's no issue with women inheriting, so she and her sister inherit all of her father's vast wealth. And she sees this, like, vibrant immigrant community in Fez of, like, people who are coming from her native Tunisia to this big city to thrive and, uh, you know, have access to all this, like, newfound knowledge that's being gathered. And she realizes we need more schools, right? Everyone's supposed to learn to read and speak Arabic. And there's so many people coming to this really thriving area of the world that we have to expand, we have to build. And so she decides that she's going to take her vast fortune, her entire inheritance, she's going to use it to build a school. Now, the schools at this point in time are referred to as madrasas. They're sort of a mix between a religious institution and an educational institution, right? So it's both a school and a place of worship and a place where you learn about religion. Uh, but it's important to note, they don't only teach religion. So you might have a madrasa, you might have a school, and that school exists because education is fundamental to the study of religion. But while you're being educated, you're absolutely going to learn about mathematics and the Greek natural philosophers and trigonometry and astronomy and how the world works around us. And so she begins to construct this school. Yes, Shep? Can you scroll over so I can see that? Oh, sorry. So, is that better? Yeah. All right. Um, so she, oh, Joaquin? Uh, so we the guiding questions that we're going to show up is three and what? Uh, guiding questions that are going to come up. You're going to see a bit of three, a bit of five, 
four. A lot of four. Four is like really important here, and a lot of seven. So a lot of four and seven today, a bit of three, a bit of five. Yeah. So those are the key things to be listening for. Listen to changes in the scientific method. Listen for how identity impacts who gets to be a scientist. Listen for, uh, there's, a, there's one very obvious mistake that you'll hear about. Um, and what was the other one I said? Um, and this whole concept, what I'm talking about now, about the idea of there being a language of scholarship, that is a precondition for people being able to build another's work. Now, instead of being limited to the work of people who speak your native language, you could be building on the work of somebody from a completely different culture from you. All right, so we have these schools called madrasas. Fatima Adri decides she's going to build one. She spends, it takes over a decade to build. Uh, according to some stories, she fasts for the entire time it's being built. Fasting doesn't mean she never eats food. It probably means she only eats food after sundown. Uh, and she builds this university. It's called the University of al Karawiyan. And if you're looking for a spelling of it, and again, there's no correct spelling in English because the word is in Arabic. It's right here. It's named after, after her hometown. Uh, and some important things to understand about this university is that, first of all, it still exists to this day. This is the world's oldest continuously running university. 1,200 years, 1,200 years, this university has stood and been educating people. It is open to people of all walks of life. You do not need to be Muslim to attend this school. You don't need to be of Arabic ethnicity to attend this school. The teaching is done in Arabic, but because Arabic has become a language of scholarship, if you're a scholar, you probably speak it. You can come to this school and learn it. You don't have to be a man to attend. She becomes one of its first graduates, Fatima Al-Fri. For a brief period in history, education and scholarship is open to everyone, regardless of your race, regardless of your gender, regardless of your religion or your country of nationality, you can come to this place and you can learn. It is, to this day, an incredibly prestigious university. Right? This is like the Moroccan version of like Princeton or Harvard. Um, it still runs. And it is an incredible sense of learning, a source of learning. And many of the things that you might take for granted can trace their history back to this particular university. So at this point in time, Europe is in a dark ages, right? There's not a lot of exciting history happening in Europe at this point in time. Um, just not much is being accomplished. Uh, and mathematics is really hard to do in Europe because the system for numbers that they're using is Roman numerals. Right. Have any of y'all learned about Roman numerals? Yeah. So what do Roman numerals look like? Uh, they're like X's, L's, uh, I's, and like V's. Yeah, so you've got these like X, I, L, V, right? Each like symbol represents a number, but there's no places. There's no sense of like the tens place or the ones place. It's not a base system. So like to say one, you would say I, to say two, you'd say I, I, to say three, you'd say I, 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 and to say four, you'd say I, V. And this makes it really, really difficult to like organize on a page and do mathematics with. So Europe isn't getting any mathematics done until a scholar from France comes down, he's a very devout Catholic, and studies at the University of al Karawiyan, learns about Arabic numerals, takes them back to France, becomes literally the Pope. Pope Sylvester II, the head of the Catholic Church at this period of time, he is a graduate of the University of al Karawiyah. So literally people who would become the heads of other religions are studying at Islamic institutions. Um, have any of you ever done any study of the Talmud, the like books of scholarship that are written about the Torah, which is the holy book in Judaism? 
All right, again, a couple of you who have done a little bit. Um, have any of those of you who have done that, or anyone just heard of a fellow by the name of Maimonides, or sometimes called Rambam? Right, I see a couple nods. Right, if you're Jewish, you might have heard of Rambam. If you do much Jewish scholarship, you will eventually hear about Rambam. He's a super famous Jewish scholar and doctor. Yes? So he's a French what? Uh, so Pope Sylvester II was a Frenchman, uh -huh. right, and a Catholic, who went and studied at the University of al Karmian, learned mathematics there, and takes that style of doing mathematics, what we call Arabic numerals, back to Europe. So Europe, like white people, got mathematics from a pope who studied at an Islamic institution in North Africa. That's how Europe got math. Hence words like algebra, that's an Arabic word. The, the A-L means like the. So if you see a word that starts with A-L, it probably is a little word from Arabic. Yes, Naya? So basically all math originated in India? Because you got the numerals and stuff from the India to the Middle East, and then the guy brought math from the Middle East to Europe, and then Europe okay, colonized here. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that, that's a fairly accurate thing. In yeah. Indian mathematicians bring their knowledge to the Middle East. So if you're Arabic, you refer to the, the number system. They don't use exactly the same letters because they have their own script, or they actually, the exact same symbols because Arabic has a different script than English. Uh, but they refer to their numbers as Hindu numerals. And we, like, or when I say we, I mean Europeans because that's my ancestry. Europeans refer to our numeral system as Arabic numerals because Europeans got it from uh, the Arab world. And, particularly via this Catholic book. Um, but we see this with other religions as well, right? Maimonides is an incredibly famous Jewish scholar. He was a doctor. Um, he is, like, you will absolutely hear about his scholarship if you spend any time, like, doing serious uh, Talmudic studies. Um, and he is a graduate of the University of al Harawiya. That's where he became a doctor. So this is in a very real way a nexus of knowledge. It's not just a place where knowledge is coming from, uh, it's not just that knowledge is flowing from the Arab world into the rest of the world, it's that knowledge comes from all over the world. Any place that Islam is spread to is coming to the Middle East, being translated into a single language of scholarship, and then from there is being spread. We have near universal literacy. We have education available to people of all genders, of all races, of all ethnicities, of all religions. It is an incredibly prosperous time in world history. And this knowledge is making its way from Islam into you know, Catholic cultures, into Jewish cultures, into cultures all over the world. All right, any questions about Fatima al-Farid? All right. 